Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. My name is Zar, and today I'm going to be walking you through um, how to implement your first compiler feature by telling you a bit about my story implementing my first compiler feature. Uh, Concepts and Clang, I'm going to first make a quick, quick like um, overview of what concepts are, um, if you're not familiar. But the talk is not going to focus on concepts, but rather on the story, on my story and my involvement with them. So it's a quick overview. First thing new in, uh, in concepts in C20 is the requires clause. Um, say if before you had this um, sort function, that's like the canonical example for concepts, that accepted a type name and begin and end iterators, and they could just mean anything. Now you can constrain them by adding a requires uh, clause right after the template parameter list with the name of a concept. For example, here I'm requiring these to be iterators. Um, another new thing you can do um, is add abbreviated templates. This and this now mean the same thing. You can write auto instead of the template parameter uh, type, and it'll completely omit, omit the uh, template um, parameter list and the template keyword. You can, um, you can articulate static requirements using concepts uh, on a set of types or just one type. For example, here uh, I can say the, con the large concept is anything that whose size is any type whose size is more than 10. And can even make more elaborate uh, concepts using the new requires keyword, new requires expression, excuse me. Um, for example, here I'm requiring that um, the T type, <coughs> well, the T type has uh, a food type inside of it. And you can do, if you have a T object and a U object, you can do T.foo, give it U, and get a foo type. You can also increment T, the sort of requirements that you can express using the requires expression. And you can also prefix the auto keyword with the name of a concept and an, an optional argument. Can you please use your mouse cursor? Because the laser pointer is not recorded and is not visible on that screen. OK. Um, wait. OK, so you can prefix uh, the auto keyword with the name of a concept with optional arguments like this. This mean that's, means that anything that you give to the do foo function must satisfy fooable with int. For example, it must be incrementable and have the ability to do t.foo and give it u. Cool. Um, one of the primary reasons concepts were uh, introduced is to have nicer error messages. For example, if you would try to have your own class A and give it as a key to an ordered map, this would happen. Okay. This is relatively good, a relatively like easy case. And with concepts, you could get something like this, telling you that A uh, is not hashable. And it's pretty readable and explains exactly what went wrong instead of giving you a, a very long error message drilling down into the internal implementation of the class you're misusing. Another cool thing you can do with concepts is overloading. Um, you can, uh, for example, have, having the sort function here you can actually um, you can actually also write the name of a concept instead of a type name uh, keyword, and have it means the same thing like before with the requires, and you can also, for example, have another version of sort and overload them based on the concept. And here, if you would call, if you were to call sort with a random access pair of iterators, it would know to select the second one because it is more specific. Okay. Um, that's like, that, that, that's what, this was a short overview of concepts, um, the main features of the um, new language feature in C20. Um, but this is not going to be the focus of this talk. Cool. So um, about me, my name is Zar, and I'm 25 from Israel. Um, I like uh, programming, graphic design, and video games. Um, and 
basically relearned C++ in 2015 and fell in love with it ever since. And I have been working on the Clang implementation of the concepts feature in the past two years. And I'm gonna be telling you about this story. So the, the best way to describe the story is, is, this is this was a very slippery slope. It started with me trying to write a game engine uh, just for a fun educational project. And it involved a lot of generics. And things were getting a little bit out of hand. Um, and at the time, Concepts had an implementation in GCC 7. And um, knowing what Concepts were, I knew that if I were to write a lot of generics, they would probably be, be of great help to use Concepts. So I was, I was like, okay, GCC 7 wasn't even out back then. Uh, it's probably still buggy. I'm not sure if anyone maintains it. Uh, it'll be fine. I'll just start using it. So I built GCC 7 and started writing a lot of code with concepts as like if it was the future. So if before I had this function, okay, this pass message function here that takes a bunch of template parameters which you know nothing about. What is this like propagate last parameter? What does it even mean? Basically like writing this auto, 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 auto. Um, now, with C++ 20 and strong typing, I could do something like this and actually specify the types of all of these generic uh, parameters and actually have an idea of what this function does um, when looking at it, which is a nice feature. Cool, so there's really no turning back after you start using concepts. I'm sure you're gonna agree with me once you do. Um, and they all lived happily ever after until I found that GCC concepts did have bugs. And, but, but you know, once, once, once the compiler has a bug, it tells you to report the bug and you can just uh, go to the bug tracker and report it, right? So I reported this bug. Um, and as you can see the date, this was the last time I've heard of this, uh, 2017. So, Turns out this, uh, this branch was not heavily maintained at the time. And not only that, I've had some, um, some problems uh, using GCC. Um, but not just GCC, I had a bunch of, um, I, as I've said, I've had a bunch of templates in my code. And compile times and error messages started getting a bit out of hand. For example, I had this unindicative error message. <laughs> um, and accusations of murder, like this one. And have the, I had this one time, I had this very, another unindicative error message. Uh, it happened when I tried to compile the project. Don't ever try this, this is super da dangerous. Um, and it froze. The whole PC froze, okay? The kernel froze, nothing, the, the mouse won't even move at that point. So I thought maybe, okay, maybe this was a very long error message. So I used fmaxerrors equals one. Do you know this flag? It just makes the compiler uh, stop it's trying to emit more error messages after it encounters the first one. Uh, by default, the compiler would just try to um, give you more, as much, as much error messages as it can give you. So this still won't work. Uh, I tried to upload the message to a file and it still doesn't, doesn't work. Um, so I thought, okay, maybe this is a problem with Windows. I was using Sigwin. Uh, maybe it's a Sigwin problem of some kind. So I moved to a Linux VM and it freezes again. And the host freezes as well. Uh, well, th this shouldn't happen. Uh, it turns out I had a BIOS problem, but <laughs> never mind. Uh, okay, so I upload the message, the error message to a file and it didn't freeze. And I had a file with the error message in it. Okay, this is like huge. It was 1.2 gigabytes. <laughs> so you might be wondering, this was with fmax errors equals one. So you might be wondering, what do, do those 1.2 gigabytes of error message say? Um, well, <laughs> how do you read 1.2 gigabytes of error? Well, some of the text editors do open this, um, like Sublime Text, for example, and it turns out this was only 10 lines of error message. 
each, each of them having about 100 megabytes of, 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 of error. Um, and they were basically something like this, just uh, template backtrace, listing, okay, I had this function bar with these 100 megabytes of template parameters of template arguments, which tried to call function baz with these 100 megabyte of uh, template arguments, and was 10 lines of this, okay? You can actually limit this, uh, the depth of this uh, template uh, backtrace, but you do need much of the information there to actually understand what went wrong, uh, because there was like a bad series of calls somewhere. Yeah, people complain about like unindicative error messages C++ gives them, I couldn't even read mine, so. Um, so the, the way I chose to go about this was to parse, okay? I started writing this Python script that um, it would take this, um, this template backtrace and collapse all the uh, elaboration of what, like for example, what T is, you would collapse it to just like one and U to two. And you could like click one to expand just one level of what T is and two to expand just one level of what U is and just do it incrementally to read whatever you actually need to read. Uh, so this doesn't work, why? No, because Python is too slow. <laughs> so I moved to C++ and, uh, and, and it worked after I like heavily optimized the C++ script uh, and I got the bug. And a few day late, days later, the PC freezes again with two gigabytes of error message uh, and the script can't handle this anymore. So I tried, I started looking for other solutions, for example, um, I noticed that the long name templates are actually compile time trees. So they had, each type name was something like this, only like 90 megabytes or something. Um, so how can we shorten these names? Okay, nice. Okay, so the thing you can do is really uh, create a new class, my tree, that inherits from all this monstrosity and inherit the constructors. So what you get is a new class that acts exactly like the previous one, only it has shorten, shorter names in the error messages. Um, <coughs> and given this, it worked and emitted only 400 megabytes of error message, which is like a piece of cake for the script. And cool. So then I was like, every like inheriting from every template like this is, is, is a pain and you can, it's not, it's not a long-term solution. And I sometimes even don't even need all the inf information. I just want the compiler to print 10, these 10 lines of, of like calls, of backtrace of calls. And it seems like there is no way to actually get the compiler to do this, to not print all of these annoying, um, um, all of this annoying data. So then I took a look at the error message I'm getting. And you see the interesting word here? It has an emoji next to it. So I saw this keyword with, and I went with it and opened up the GCC binary, okay? And if you can see over there, uh, it's probably hard to see from back there, but you can actually see the, wait, wait, wait. You can actually see the with keyword over here in the binary. Okay, so this is the function which prints all of these hundreds of megabytes of error message. So I just patched it to uh, return and, uh, and, GCC now, and now it printed out the error messages instantly and I had no problems ever since. Uh, so yeah, this was like the, my first time uh, messing with uh, uh, the actual compiler. So I, I was like, okay, if I'm already patching GCC, um, I had this other problem which I couldn't get around, which, is what, which was that I needed to debug a lot of compile time things. I had a lot of templates. And there was no like print, proper print debugging at compile time. So I, was thought, I thought to myself, let's add some print debugging at compile time because like print debugging is one of the uh, most important tools we have as programmers. So how can we meta program if we don't have meta printing? 
um, sign open up uh, GCC's sources. And good thing GCC's sources are so nice. For example, here is parser.c, which parses all of C++. Um, and as you can see, <laughs> it's a light read. Um, and there are bigger files, and maybe they've gotten bigger since I took this picture. Um, well, so my idea was to add the keyword static print. Um, the keyword would act like this. You would just stick it somewhere and give it um, a bunch of um, string literals and other compile time things, and it would print, and by compiling this, it would print out uh, the strings and the compile time things. For example, here, uh, you, get, you, you ask it to print decal type of y, and it would print test int three. Y's type is test in three while you were compiling the program, not while you were running it. So how do you add a keyword to C++? Um, well, I did take compilers class back in university, and I know that there's probably a nice little file that defines the grammar declaratively, and I can just go, go in there and add the new keyword, right, with the syntax and everything. Well, uh, the real world isn't so pretty and or well, maybe C++ world isn't so pretty. And it's just functions all the way down that parse uh, the thing. So what do we do now? So I had no other way to handle this and I went with copy paste, copy and paste. Um, and I had this observation that static print behaves awfully similar to static assert. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to convince you about that it can appear in the same places, which is basically like everywhere. And it also parses string literals, right? Static assert has an error message that it can print out, and we need st like string literals for printing during the static print. And it also starts with static underscore and is pink in the slides. Um, so the plan was like this. Search the whole sources of GCC for static assert, find wherever the keyword is being parsed, and where it is, whatever it is, just duplicate it and rename it to static print and do this uh, recursively. Okay, let's see how this goes. Um, I found this thing. This is a list of uh, sort of an array of structs and I saw all the C++ keywords over there. One of them was static assert. And it had a bunch of other things in there. I just duplicated this line and renamed it to static print. There was RID static assert, we named it to RID static print. Uh, there are a couple bunch of other flags in there. They seemed okay, so I kept them. Um, and then I did this with RID static print, which I now needed to find. Um, I found this enum listing RID static assert, added a, an RID static print right after it. Um, then I searched for other uses of RID static assert, and then I found this piece of code. If the next token is static assert, we have a static assertion, and this if that checks whether you have an RID static assert and calls CP parser static assert. So, if the next token is static print, we have a static print statement and call, of course, uh, CP parser static print. Uh, we still need to write that function. Uh, so now we reach the business logic itself. Um, CP parser static assert. Um, this is the whole function. Uh, I'm gonna highlight the interesting bits of it. For example, here, we can see that they're looking for the static assert keyword because there's a comment that says that they're looking for the static assert keyword. Uh, there's a string literal parsing like we expected. Cool. Um, and here they're parsing a constant expression, which is nice, but not enough, right? We wanted to be able to give this thing anything, not just constant expressions, but also types or template names Something, we need something more general than this for parsing our static print statement. Any ideas where we can find something that can give us um, the, the, the thing we need? With. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> no, not with. <laughs> <laughs> what, what else in the language can be both uh, uh, expressions and types and template names? Template arguments, that's right. So I found this function, cp parser template argument. 
and I just used it. I arranged a function to look just like picking and choosing uh, the right things from static assert using CP parser temp template arguments for the arguments, and it worked. And I compiled the first program using static print. But then there was a bug. This code does not work. And I'll give you a hint. If you check that, if you try to print out whether size of t is equal to three, it does work. Yeah, okay, so, so we used a CP parser template argument to parse this, this size of t is greater than three, and when it sees the greater than, it says, okay, that's the end of the template argument, uh, and doesn't continue to parse anything. Um, the lesson learned here is that uh, copying and pasting may break some hidden code assumptions, and so when, when you use some functions you see somewhere, try to like at least figure out whether there are these hidden assumptions in the code, and um, try to adjust for that somehow. And okay, now it really worked. I uh, mod modified uh, CP parser template argument, a very hacky solution. And but now it really does work, and I could like print debug my own code at compile time. Uh, which is pretty cool. Then I thought to myself, maybe others would like to use, use this as well. So I had four options as, it's, as, I, as I saw them back then. Um, first one was just to use it to myself, which is no work, which is also always good. Uh, second option was to publish the .patch file so people can download GCC sources, apply the patch, then build it for themselves and have static print in their own code, which is probably a day's work roughly. I could try getting this merged into GCC, which was a month's work and might not be accepted because this is non-standard and I'm not sure. I could propose this to the standard, which is like two years, and there's, there were already, already some other proposals like this in circulation. Uh, so I went with number two, seemed like a reasonable compromise. Um, so I posted this Reddit post saying that I had uh, this new static print statement. You can uh, print debugging during, use print debugging during compile time. Uh, then this, this person seemed upset about this. <laughs> Turns out I was cheating. Um, anyway, uh, also I got featured on uh, C++ Weekly and Pretty cool, which was pretty cool. And I also published the patch file to GitHub. And can you see the problem here? Hmm? Yeah, that's right. There was an issue. Even has a red circle over it. Um, what was the issue? Build fails at stage two. Um, so something, 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 the, I couldn't build this because it fails during stage two. What is stage two? Let me uh, walk you through what boot, bootstrapping is. Say, say a new version of GCC comes out, okay, with new optimizations. If you compile the new version, you get a compiler, that, a compiler that builds faster code, right? But the compiler itself was built with an older compiler, so the compiler itself is slow. What can you do? Compile the compiler again with itself, and get a fast compiler that builds fast code. This is stage two. Um, but maybe your optimizations broke something. So you compile it again and check whether you got the same result as stage two, and this is stage three. Uh, this is a TLDR if you didn't get it. <coughs> so what was the problem? How, ca how come compilation failed only on stage two and not on stage one? Well, we added, a, we added a new keyword, right? Static print. And in stage one, we used the compiler without that keyword. And I had a local variable named static print. So in stage two, using static print as a variable name is, an, is, a, is a syntax error. And this is why this failed. And I just changed the variable name and, and well, it, it just worked. Cool, so what now? Um, 
I also have used static print to like profile my uh, long compilation times. I would like place a static print before a big template, uh, then call a function that instantiates the, a, a huge template, and then place another static print after it, like a poor man's profiler. Uh, Clang had some sort of a template profiler, but Clang had no implementation of concepts, so I couldn't use it. Um, and it was still pretty slow. And also GCC had this page on their website saying, oh, we know our compiler is slow and we need to take care of that, of that someday. Um, so I, that wasn't very uplifting. And some say Clang is faster. So I had four options as I saw it back then. First option to drop the project entirely, which is no work, which is always good. Second is stop using concepts, which is like a week's work and the lifetime of regret. Optimize GCC, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, or implement concepts in Clang myself, which was like a month or two. Uh, <laughs> So I went with the last one. This, this, this was my line of reasoning back then, uh, really. Um, so yeah, concepts in Clang. Um, someone's probably done it already, right? Um, let's Google that. So I found this, concept Clang, an implementation of C++ concepts in Clang. Sounds reasonable, right? Well, um, what's the problem here? Yeah, the, the, can you see the year? Turns out Clang is very quick. Uh, they implemented uh, concepts nine years before they were imported into the standard. So, and if you check, take a look, you can also see that um, the syntax here is pretty weird. Um, it doesn't look anything like what we have today. And what, 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 like, um, what, what it turns out is that, and also found this uh, little article by Bjarne, um, Concepts were previously merged into C++11 um, and were basically ripped out before C++11 uh, was published. And this is a three-page article in which Bjarne uh, uh, explains why this happened and why it's terrible and uh, very sad. So this implementation was outdated. Uh, I also found some, so this page that, uh, about, uh, that lists uh, Clang's um, standard support and under concepts didn't really say whether it was work in progress or not. Um, just linked to this paper um, and this mailing list. Someone tried to ask what what like what's the status of concepts. I, I see that it's work in progress, but I don't know if it's like we're just testing some last things out or it's on the to do list. And um, someone replied that. Uh, the uh, Clang concept development is occurring on trunk. So I downloaded Clang trunk and built it. Turns out we even, like Clang even had an NF concepts DS flag that you can pass in to enable concept support. It's pretty cool, but it seemed to just like parse requires clauses and ignore them. <laughs> uh, anyway, it seems like no substantial work has been done uh, at that point. So this was uh, uh, a point where I had to like um, had this really as a realization that I'm not a compiler engineer, okay? I've never done anything related to compilers. Why would the Clang gods even let me work on their compiler? Uh, and so I, 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 I had this plan to, to overcome all this. I would just implement the whole feature without asking anyone. <laughs> this is step one. Step two, show up at Clang's door with everything implemented and they just uh, accept me and, and, and merge it. Uh, so I started working. Um, and how hard could it be, right? Just a bunch of error messages, concepts. Um, but how do you implement a C++ feature? Well, where, where do you even start uh, implementing something like this? Well, remember this? That paper over there, well, I don't know if, you ever, if you've ever taken a look at the C++ paper, but they are basically diffs to the standard text, okay? So this is an excerpt from uh, the concepts paper. Uh, it's a literal diff to the standard text. For example, here you add concept to the list of entities, you remove the or there and add or concept to the end. It's a very, uh, um, just a diff. 
this diff is 36 pages long. Uh, compared to the size of the standard, it's not a lot, but this is still a pretty big uh, patch. So I said, well, okay, let's start slowly and we'll just add the concept definition. Seems easy enough. This is how it's defined in the paper. You have the template head and then the concept definition, which is just a keyword concept, then a name, then an equals uh, token, then a, const a con constraint ex expression, which I guess is just an expression. Um, how do you add concept? Well, I'm gonna use the only tool I have in my arsenal right now, which is copy and paste. Uh, and I, would, I will search for something that looks, that for, I, I just, I'll search the whole uh, project for a file named template something. And I found template decal.h. And it had a class named template decal. And a bunch of other classes inheriting from it and from redeclarable template decal, which I assumed meant something with redeclarations where you would uh, declare a template then define it later. Concepts don't seem to be redeclarable according to the syntax, so I just uh, inherited from template decal. And this is roughly how it looked like. So I stored a con constraint expression using an expression pointer because that's how it seemed things went there. I uh, had to, all these parameters being passed to template decal and the constraint expression uh, also had to create and create deserialize because all the other cool kids seem to, seem to have them uh, around, all the other classes. Had a getter and setter uh, because why not? Um, and a bunch, a bunch of other boilerplate um, that you need for uh, classes uh, in the ASD and a bunch of other friends down there because everybody seemed to be friends with these uh, classes. Uh, yeah, so I had no real idea what all of these were, but I just went with it uh, at that point. So now I want to parse this thing. Well, first I'm gonna make this, make this compile, okay? So I just search uh, for something that's roughly similar to a concept and try to add concepts to all these places. What's like roughly similar to a concept? Variable templates, Variable templates that's right. Uh, and there's this var template decal. Looks pretty similar, right? So yeah, a bunch of matches. Um, so I do this for a while. Um, had to go all th through all manner of weird stuff like uh, ASD dumper, ASD reader, ASD writer, a uh, bunch of mentions of var template in non-code files like this, okay? So there's var template over there. So I just added concept down there to look, that, and make it look, make it, made it look uh, believable. Um, and a bunch of switch cases that like handle all the things and I just added concept down there and it compiles, okay? This was amazing. Um, and now I wanted to parse this thing and following var template decal around was pretty tough, so I went with something simpler and just followed the template keyword. And I found this. This is a diagnostic that says something about templates, and, and it's, it's in a function named parse template parameters. Seems pretty uh, promising because it's supposed to be close to the actual parsing of the concept keyword. And I went up and I found uh, this, you just check for the template keyword, then parse the template parameter list. Pretty cool. Then down the line, I had parse single declaration after template. Seems very promising. I just left this if there. Uh, if we have a concept keyword, just parse the concept definition. And parse concept definition. Um, again, pretty simple. I just uh, saw, uh, looked around and saw how people check for keywords. Um, how an expression is parsed, used parse expression, and uh, uh, consumed the semicolon in the end. Um, and then I called act on concept definition because everything around me seemed uh, to do the same thing uh, in the end, all the parse methods. And it worked. Um, concept, uh, the concept was parsed, but then there was a bug. The following code compiles. What's the problem here? There's a, there, there is no B, right? So what, this compiles, but th what does it do? 
<laughs> right? It's pretty surprising. Um, well, spot the bug. Yeah. Well, I do check it. No. No, that's actually, but, but the, the, the bug is there in the parse expression. And I don't know how you missed this, but I should have called actions.correct delay typos in expr on parse <laughs> expression and not just parse expression, of course. Um, so yeah, it turns out uh, when you try to use parse expression and it encounters a non-existent identifier, it just tries to guess what you actually meant and returns that expression, um, treats it as a typo. Um, so it actually returned A here. Um, <laughs> and at calling correct delay typos in expr causes the, um, the diagnostic to be printed. But if you don't do it, then it just doesn't get printed and you, your program compiles Fine. Um, so yeah, there are a bunch of unwritten rules in the code base. Um, and there are some things that you're probably not going to know until you use them and incorrectly and debug the consequences. And like, for example, a bunch of stack objects you need to instantiate, uh, layering, why you need both a parse concept uh, decal and actum concept decal and concept decal.create and the constructor of concept decal. And this is, a, this is a, actually a point uh, for copy and paste because if you uh, actually read code that does something similar to what you want to do, you would find out all these rules and um, save yourself um, having to discover them on your own. Um, so a good strategy when you try to implement something is to always find something that's roughly similar to what you want to do and see how things like this happen in the code base. And yeah, another thing that, that happens here, which is a, like a very uh, important uh, principle in compilers, is that um, there's no quit outs when you're compiling. If, you, if the user made a mistake, you're going to try to, you're going to fire an error message, but then guess what he actually meant and, and continue compiling as if he actually did it. Um, which is, a, which, is a, which, which is what allows the compiler to keep compiling even though you did something wrong. Um, another, uh, another nice principle that you can use is that, uh, is the following. Uh, this is a trailing return type syntax, okay? So which is correct? This one, placing the requires clause before the trailing uh, return type or placing it after the trailing return type? Hmm? No, it's actually the second one. Uh, but uh, user, users are still going to get confused about this. And in practice, I just try both ways and accept both of them, just issue, a, issue an error message if you get them wrong. Um, so yeah, as a compiler, you need to try to defend the user from the standard which he didn't read and try to um, account for common mistakes. Um, I need to expect the unexpected. Another thing I learned the hard way is that every word used in, used in the standard is there for a reason, and cutting corners almost never works, and almost always ends in death. Uh, for example, here. Uh, say I have these two overloads. One of them requires that size of t is larger than one, and one of them requires that size of t is both larger than one and larger than equal to four. And then I call foo of int. Which one of these should get called? Second one, right? <laughs> yeah, the second one should get called, right? But this actually doesn't work. Okay, this is ambiguous. Why is that? Well, let's see the standard. Uh, two atomic constraints are identical if they are formed from the same expression and the targets of the parameter mappings are equivalent. This is the same expression, right? Size of t is greater than one appears in both places. Okay, so why isn't it the same expression? Well, it's the same expression, 
but not the same expression. <laughs> when you say expressions in italics, you actually mean the grammar rule expression. And because they are derived from different places in the source, this means they are not equivalent. You have to actually go ahead and place this size of t greater than 1 in a concept in order for this to work. So, yeah. Uh, I've had numerous bug reports uh, complaining that this doesn't work, where it actually it is invalid to do such a thing, but nobody in the world is going to know this. So in practice, I try both ways and complain uh, if the user probably got it wrong. Uh, anyway, uh, I continue like copying and pasting my way around the feature. For example, how would you find the place to place the actual checks that a, the, con the concept is satisfied for a given set of arguments? Um, you can, I'm going to, uh, in the rest of time, I just search for the error message uh, produced when, for example, you give the wrong number of template parameters, of template arguments, okay? There's a specific error message that gets emitted, just search for it, and then I find the place that checks whether a given set of arguments matches a given set of parameters, okay? That's a cool, like, little neat way to find the, the place you need to find. And I finished most of the feature in about, about a month's work. Okay? So what now? Um, so I have most of the feature um, implemented. At least that's what I thought. And I was just about to show up to the Clang uh, community with my patch ready to merge. Then I saw this um, little uh, page on uh, the LVM, LVM development manual saying we have a strong list dislike for huge changes in long-term development branches. And also a friend uh, warned me how, how hard it is to get, getting stuff merged into LLVM. Uh, well, shit. Uh, <laughs> plan B. Uh, instead of just showing up with a patch ready to merge, I would just break what I did into uh, commit size steps of what, how I would theoretically implement concepts in Clang um, and just show up with the plan instead. So I did it. I uh, created this repo, Clang Concepts Roadmap, uh, listing the steps required, in my opinion, to implement concepts in Clang. And then there was the moment of truth, uh, one of the most stressful emails I've ever sent, uh, explaining um, a bunch of things that we need to implement concepts right now, and it's really not that hard, it can be done in a month or two, and um, uh, we have this, I have prepared this roadmap, and, and if you really want, I can also do it myself. Uh, then I got uh, an, an error mail saying <laughs> I'm not on the, I'm not on the uh, mailing list, so I can't even send mails there. Uh, then I joined the mailing list, then Richard here, um, replied saying, uh, thank you for offering to help out. Uh, we were actually looking for people to implement uh, concepts. We wanted to do it, but we, no one had the time to devote to the task. Uh, also Hubert, um, which was also involved, um, saying, yeah, we just needed uh, people with time to actually go ahead and implement this. So yeah, great success. Uh, and yeah, I was basically preaching to the choir. Um, they wanted to implement concepts and had no, had no one to do it. So, uh, <laughs> and then I get and I got this reply saying, uh, uh, "I want to help you implement your roadmap. I've al already finished point one and I'm working on two and three. If I have any questions, I'll let you know." And I was like, "Whoops." <laughs> uh, it was not an appropriate time to tell him that I already have the thing ready. Uh, and then four months later, I realized why small commits are a good thing. Um, and it turns out that actually imp implementing and testing this correctly takes longer than just, uh, I believe, a month or two. And after about four months uh, doing this in my spare time, uh, I reached the same point uh, I had before sending that email, but with like properly tested um, patches. Um, and a few people on Reddit suggested that I get this up on Compiler Explorer. Uh, so I sent an email to Matt, um, and he put it up there. 
Um, and a bunch more people uh, copied, copied my steps later. Uh, then I wanted to let the world know uh, that someone is, is, is implementing concepts in uh, Clang and there's hope. Um, so I sent this Reddit post, which was pretty cool. Um, but what, 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 what's wrong with this post? Yeah, there, there's this typo, which I've only noticed recent, recently. But there's something fundamentally wrong in this post. No. <laughs> well, maybe. Can you see it now? <laughs> yeah. Well, I published this on April 1st. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, lesson learned. Uh, all I had left at that point was requires expressions, the new expressions that let you uh, um, uh, express static requirements. Seems easy enough, right? Well, no, <laughs> it wasn't so easy. Probably most, one of the most complicated expressions ever. Uh, but I parsed it after like eternity. And now the compiler was feature complete. And I had another post, um, not on April Fools, uh, um, letting the world know. Um, ever since, I've been fi fixing um, a bunch of bugs that, that uh, people in the concepts and rages community reported. Um, on CVP Slack, um, but then in November, uh, I had this Reddit post that they merged a new syntax into the concept working draft. <laughs> Yay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't feature complete anymore. Um, but uh, actually, I finished uh, this feature just recently. Um, now I am feature complete uh, according to the standard. Uh, thank you. And I'm uh, right now working uh, on fixing CR comments, a uh, bunch of uh, issues that I still have, and merging this into trunk. Um, I have a bunch of uh, commits uh, waiting. I have one of them merged already, uh, but I've been working on my talk uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of time recently, so. Probably we'll get more time to work on this soon. And how do you implement your first compiler feature? Um, I have this formula, which is uh, basically my, my experience here. Um, you, you start out like the, the basic thing you need to do when you try to implement a compiler feature, or how it usually works when I try to like, implement a, even a part of concepts, for example. I start by reading a bunch of code. Um, could be the code needed to be changed, understanding the, the code around the, thing, the place you need to be changed, or, or code doing similar things. And there's probably al always a code that does, a piece of code that does a similar thing to what you're trying to achieve somewhere in the code base. And then you come to the part where you, you, you know what you need to do, but there is a bunch of ways to actually do it and they vary by, um, by where, where they are, where, where it is that you want to actually implement the change, where in the compiler, where in the compilation process. There's usually a bunch of places where you can actually place the change. And uh, sometimes we get to a place where you know you can change it here, but you don't have the required information to actually do it, and how to get like, information from this part of the compilation process down to here. And like the alternatives may vary and how, how, difficult they, how difficult this way of implementing the change is going to be or not. And then you're going to implement the simplest alternative, um, uh, requiring the fewest uh, changes or breaking uh, the current uh, code. Then the tests are going to fail. Then you debug them. Then you understand why the alternative you chose is bad, and then you go back uh, to then you go to the next alternative. 
after you exit the loop, um, you put it up for CR and you go back to step one dot F. Uh, <laughs> then you let users find bugs. Then you go back to one dot E. Um, so yeah, it's um, a lot of the challenge, uh, then profit. Um, a, a lot of the, um, a lot of actually, a lot of the work here is handling a very large, very complicated code base. And um, a very good way to actually um, manage this is to um, first realize, f first, hacking on compilers is fun. It's, it's not very, um, it's not this um, uh, insurmountable uh, code base that you can't even uh, open. It's just another C++ code base doing some complicated things, but it's still C++. And it's, very, it's, it's a pretty fun thing to do. Uh, anyone with the control key can do it. Um, and the, the way to approach this is be naive at first. Try the simplest solution. And you're probably not going to um, nail it on the first try, but um, you can always learn from your mistakes, which is the best way to learn, probably, and from CR. Uh, you need to search really hard for developer's manuals. I've had some uh, very long hours of debugging that could have been saved if I had uh, found the relevant developer's manual. I did search for some, but I didn't search hard enough. Um, um, realize that everything in the standard is there for a reason, and there's no uh, cutting corners. And in general, take control of your compiler. You're going to probably run at some point into a place where um, you're limited by what your compiler can do. And just know that, it, that it's not, um, that it is possible to change that. Um, whether it's giving you uh, nicer compilation error messages and errors or uh, implementing a, sm a nice little feature that you need for your project or implementing a C++ 20 feature. Um, the fastest way to get C++ 20 is to implement it yourself. Uh, <laughs> It's not a necessarily very fast way to get it, but it's, a fast, it's probably the fastest way. Um, so yeah, th that was the story of concepts in Clang. And I hope you realized how you could implement your first compiler feature. Thank you. Thanks for the, uh, for the talk. Uh, you said yet you implemented it in one month. In one month of full-time or part-time work? Uh, like part-time, but uh, like all-nighters. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how do you combine full-time job with part-time work on this kind of feature? Um, how, how many hours a, a, a day Well, it depends. Sleep? I had like, uh, um, I had some periods of time where I would like not work on this at all. And then like a, a month where I had li relatively small, like other things to do, amount of thing to, other things to do. So I like put in three, four hours a day. Any more questions? Great talk. Um, what happened uh, to the work of the compiler writer who was also implementing concepts? Oh, so oh, the, was there like overlapping? Uh, he, uh, he quit after a uh, couple months. Okay. He didn't have time for it. Okay. Hi, uh, thanks, that's a, a great talk. Uh, just one comment, which is, um, this is not just how to implement your first compiler feature. This is still what I do for every compiler feature I implement. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Cool. <laughs> thanks for the comment. I apologize if I missed it, but is there a place we could grab a binary to try it out? Uh, concepts in Clang? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you can visit my, um, my GitHub. And there's instruction there, instructions there on how to build it. Uh, thank you for the talk. That was fantastic. Um, I think it's important to note that the person that just said uh, that's what I do for every compiler feature was Richard Smith, the editor of the ISO standard. Yeah. <laughs> An implementer of most features in, in Clang. Any other questions? 
Well, thank you.